Well guys, at this point in time, I'm pretty sure that you knew that this video was coming out at some point in time because of the fact that last year, a bunch of new CPU architectures were launched that basically threw a bunch of CPU cooler testing methodology straight out the window. I'm talking, of course, about Intel's 12th and 13th gen, and of course, the Ryzen 7000 series. Now, what I wanted to do in this video is round up all of the best of the best CPU coolers that are out there right now. The other reason why I wanted to do this other than the new CPUs that have rolled out is the fact that this year marks probably one of the first years that a lot of manufacturers are going to be coming out with new high-end CPU coolers. So something like the Deepcool Assassin 4 that we covered, there's gonna be the Thermaltake Tough Air 710, and a bunch of other ones. So I thought that now would be the best time to see if the best of the best CPU coolers before all the other ones roll out are still some of the best. So let's meet some of these. And of course, everyone's top dog is the Noctua NHD. D15. It's a dual tower monster with a pair of 140 millimeter NF A15 fans. This design has actually been around since 2014 and honestly it's aged like fine wine since then. But with chiplet designs and dense transistor layouts concentrating tons of heat into smaller packages, today's CPUs behave a lot differently from the ones launched almost seven years ago. And those realities have actually caused Noctua to announce the D15's successor will be launched at some point. Perfection takes time, guys. Of course, if you have the D15 in charts, you've also gotta be thinking about the Dark Rock Pro 4, a cooler that's a match for Noctua's flagship in a lot of people's eyes. It's also massive, but more focused on silence than the Noctua is, believe it or not. Other than that, even five years after its release, this is still considered an awesome heatsink. There's also the Noctua NH-U12A, which is basically a souped up U12S with dual high static pressure fans and an expanded much, much denser fin array. This one's actually the only cooler here with a single tower, and that's something you have to take note of as we go on. Of course, I also had to include one of my favorite coolers of all time, the Fuma 2 Revision B. It's combination of amazing cooling potential at some of the lowest noise levels we've ever seen, of course, gives it a spot here. The main problem right now though is actually finding one, especially for its launch price of $65 here in North America. I also wanted to include one of the best all-around coolers I tested last year, and that's the Deepcool AK620. You all know how much I talked this thing up over the last few months, since on the previous test system, it could almost, and I mean almost, keep up with the D15, which is impressive for a cooler that costs about half as much and is easier to find than a hell of a lot of the others here. The last one is, of course, the Thermalrite Peerless Assassin 120, which, and I don't care what other cooler company you're a fanboy of, is hands down the absolute best bang for buck heatsink that I've ever reviewed, period. At least on our last test system. It might not have the clean looks of the AK620 or the Noctua brand name behind it, but for about 40 bucks, yeah, you heard that right, 40 bucks, it can beat or match competitors that retail for almost three times more. Uh, hi, I'm the Lanko 3. Ever since I learned to talk, I can't stop. These panels help you get inside, but it's also kind of in my mouth. I'm obsessed with panels though. I have more in the back to hide cables. Good thing I work out to carry those three radiators. The fans have not yet learned to speak, but they're very pretty to look at. And I love when the air brushes against my metal skin. I prefer them closer. My brother is more quiet. I wonder what he's thinking. I was born to excel though. <laughs> Find me below. And let's also have a very serious talk here about the current generation of CPUs and how they've changed things in such a way that a lot of the old metrics when it comes to benchmarking CPU coolers have completely change. The main reason for that is both AMD and Intel are now striving to hit a thermal limit regardless of how much cooling you throw at it. So these coolers are now going to be judged on performance, not necessarily on the temperatures they achieve, but on the clock speeds they allow the CPUs to hit. You can actually see that in the two deep dive videos I did about this 
focusing on each separate platform. I'll leave links to those in the description below since they're almost essential viewing before you believe all the ridiculous hype swirling around CPU temperatures these days. Especially when you consider I also ended up running ITX coolers on AMD's Ryzen 7000 processors without too much of a problem. But anyways, all of the lessons that we learned from all of the research that went into those videos is directly trickling down into this one. And of course, any other CPU cooler review that we do this year. And I also, of course, wanted to talk a little bit more about the methodology of this video. A lot of that in clear detail is linked in the description below. There's a complete write-up about that, but let's talk about a little bit of the elements that you need to know about. The first thing you'll notice is we're not using a new Ryzen 7000 series CPU here, since AMD's extremely thick IHS becomes a bottleneck long before the heatsink even gets involved. Basically, you can throw an almost unlimited amount of cooling at these processors and not see much thermal improvement. So I guess that leaves us with Intel's 13th gen, and yes, I know it has its own set of issues, like motherboard manufacturers just going balls to the wall with TDP outside of Intel's own guidance. But as I've shown, that is completely manageable. So for this video and upcoming videos, we're going to be using a 13900K, which is set to three different power outputs. First, there's a setting of 180 watts that's meant to replicate a lower heat load of something like a 13600K or 13700. Next up is the 13900K operating at Intel's limits. And finally, there's the chip running without any limits whatsoever at a constant 300 or so watts, or what some other boards do in their default settings. A lot more emphasis here is going to be put on gaming temperatures because that's what most of you are going to be doing with your systems. And in order to represent a worst case scenario, we're running those without any limits. Finally, about the charts. Since we're comparing temperatures to the amount of noise each cooler produces, the best coolers here will have the best temperatures possible at the lowest noise levels. Meanwhile, the last thing you want to see here are lines that are high and also long, because that would mean a cooler gets loud and also stays hot. I should also mention that this testing and all the testing that you will see in every CPU cooler review coming up is all about the coolers themselves, nothing else. So there are no contact frames or any special sort of like helpers being involved here other than our trusty tube of MX4 thermal compound. So with that out of the way, let's talk about how all of these perform at 180 watts. Remember, these are high-end air coolers, so every single one of them should ace this test. And that's exactly what happens, since even the worst performing coolers here, the Fuma 2 Revision B and Noctua U12A stick to 80 degrees or below at 36 decibels. But while the U12A has a pretty linear progression through its entire range, the Fuma 2 has a sweet spot right around 38 decibels or about 75% fan speed. The AK620 gets some pretty good results here too by being consistently 1 to 2.5 degrees better than the more expensive U12A across every single noise level. At this lower wattage though, the Peerless Assassin and D15 are the real champions. And remember, this is from a cooler that costs one third the price of the Noctua these days. The D15 does edge it out by a degree here and there, but if you're willing to push fan speeds, the Assassin can get really loud and also gains an extra gear for cooling. The Dark Rock Pro 4 is probably the biggest surprise because its performance is solidly in the middle of the pack. That's not where anyone expected it, I'm sure. Most of all me but I'll explain a little bit more later. If we narrow this down to 38 decibels, there's actually only five degrees separating all of these coolers. So they're all more than enough for mid-level Intel CPUs nowadays, at least from a temperature standpoint. But what does that five degree delta do for clock speeds though? The answer to that is not really much and definitely not enough to be picked up by benchmarks. We're talking about a maximum 35 megahertz gap even with the best of the best air coolers running at full fan speed versus something like the Fuma 2 Revision B running at low speeds. And what happens if we run the 13900K at Intel's stock settings and limits? 
First, the bad news. The Scythe Fuma 2 Revision B and Dark Rock Pro 4 both fail to get under 100 degrees here, but the Fuma does manage to pull its feet out of the fire above 30 decibels. Meanwhile, the AK620 and U12A might hit 100 at 36 decibels, but turn up those fans and things start to get better. The Deepcool has a narrow lead at lower noise levels, while the Noctua pulls in front by a degree or two as fan speeds increase. Moving on to the top two, and the D15 does have a very small edge, especially as we move beyond 38 decibels. But the Peerless Assassin really hangs in there. It's actually the first air cooler we've seen that gets below 90 degrees on a 13900K with these settings. I mean, it needs to get loud to get those numbers, but that's still freaking impressive. At 38 decibels, you can really see there's a gap between the best of the best and pretty much everything else here. Yet, like I keep saying, Temperatures, especially when you're hitting 100 degrees on these CPUs, only tells a small amount of the story. Clock speeds are what really matters, and the Fuma Be Quiet U12A and AK620 show that perfectly. Even though all of them are running at 100 degrees at 36 decibels, there's actually a 110 megahertz uplift when stepping up from the struggling Pro 4 to the Deep Cool and that gap stays pretty much the same throughout their noise ranges. Yet while the Dark Rock is going completely off the rails, the Peerless Assassin and D15 get the best possible clock speeds in an all-core workload. And if we overlay the temperature graph over this one, you can see that as the CPU's heat gets lower, frequencies do increase, but there's also a point of diminishing returns. So while the Peerless Assassin gets a lot louder and cooler than the others, the actual performance benefits are minimal at best. I mean, if you distill this down to 38 decibels, it might not visually look like there's much, but the last thing anybody wants is to spend $100 or more on a high-end air cooler only to leave performance on the table. And that's what happens since there's a gap of a good 170 megahertz between the D15 and Peerless Assassin and the back of the pack, so the Dark Rock. And the last stop here, well, it's the big boy. It is the situation that happens when a lot of motherboards are left to their own devices and they allow the 13900K to consume as much power as it possibly wants until it hits basically its thermal limit. And of course, that causes a bunch of problems that we're about to see. I'll say this right away. This isn't an area where air coolers are really meant to play. This is 280 or 360 millimeter AIO or custom loop territory. And that's pretty obvious here with everything pegged at 100 degrees. Drill down into those clock speeds though, and this is where the D15's massive cooling capacity can start to stretch its legs, but only at its highest fan speed setting against the Assassin. And the rest of the coolers are behind, like really far behind, to the tune of 200 to 250 megahertz in some extreme cases like the Dark Rock, Scythe, and U12A. And the only way out of that hole is to run them at much higher fan speeds. You can really see that here, since those two front runners keep increasing their lead over the others at 38 decibels. And to be honest with you, I never imagined the thermal right would be right up there with the D15, but here we are. At this point in time though, I think it's time to take just a little, little bit of a break and I hope you guys are gonna bear with me here because I need to discuss what I'm sure many people are thinking and that is like, what in the hell is going on with the Dark Rock Pro 4? And look, this isn't just from one sample. We actually bought two other samples of this cooler and they both perform exactly the same. Basically, what you're seeing here is a heatsink being almost overwhelmed, not because of any design issues, because it's an extremely well-designed cooler, but rather there's a fan bottleneck. The silent wings on this thing are based on Be Quiet's older design principles. So from the get-go, they're simply outclassed by newer fans that can move more air at a given decibel level. Plus, they also run at some of the lowest rotational speeds too. Another problem is they can't actually be changed out easily since their mounting points are completely different from standard 25 millimeter fans. Anyways, 
We passed all of this through Be Quiet and they actually agreed with our findings, which is why replacing the Pro 4 is one of their absolute priorities right now. But remember what I said about gaming being oh so important? Well, that's just because most of you are gaming with your systems. You're not hitting them with a full core workload all day every single day. But then again, gaming is not exactly the easiest thing these days either for CPU coolers. That's because higher end GPUs end up just dumping a lot of their heat directly into the vicinity of the CPU socket area. So let's see exactly what that looks like in this scenario. Because even with those factors running against them, none of these coolers really struggles, though some are obviously better than others. For example, the Peerless Assassin and D15 stick to being the best of the best. Actually, the Assassin sort of flatlines here because the CPU isn't actually producing enough heat to benefit those higher fan speeds. The same goes for the D15, though it's able to really start compensating for those higher ambient temperatures above 38 decibels. That's what all of that cooling mass brings to the table. Meanwhile, the AK620 is a solid third place and it leads the Dark Rock Pro 4 by a lot at first, though the Be Quiet cooler narrows the gap at higher noise levels. And the Fuma 2 almost matches it too. The U12A was a bit of a disappointment here though, at least in relation to other high-end air coolers, it just failed to live up to expectations by needing higher noise levels to match the Fuma 2. And that's likely due to it being the only one with a single tower design here. So basically all the other ones have that cooling mass to spare, whereas this one doesn't. Narrowing this down to 38 decibels, you can see there's almost an eight degree difference separating the D15 from the U12A, but does that lead to anything meaningful when it comes to actual performance? The answer to that is no, absolutely not. All of these coolers essentially got the exact same frame rate results regardless of the temperature they were operating at. But in the end, 80 degrees or 60 degrees temperature here, it doesn't matter for frame rates. So I guess it's time to wrap this thing up. The first thing I wanted to mention is something that you all have to take into account, is you might wanna draw yourselves back from the hype train when it comes to cooling Intel 13th gen and Ryzen 7000 series with air cooling. Any of these air coolers and even some mid-level options are perfectly, perfectly capable of cooling down a current generation CPU, as long as the motherboard doesn't do some sort of freaking madness. But there are a couple of recommendations that I have right now, right here before new coolers are introduced. First of all, the Thermalrite Peerless Assassin is the best CPU cooler we tested last year and it remains the best. Yes, the Noctua D15 can edge it out here and there, but you have to take price into consideration. This thing is perfectly capable of cooling down an Intel 13th gen CPU just as well as the D15 at about one third of the price. And that is very, very, very impressive. Now, if you want to combine looks, performance, and price, the AK620 is another recommendation here. It looks good, it cools well, and it doesn't cost an absolute fortune. The D15, on the other hand, that is still the king of the king. The only problem is it's very, very hard to justify anybody buying a new D15 right now simply because of the fact that Noctua is coming out with its replacement relatively soon. If you already have one, be confident it's going to perform amazingly on current generation CPUs. But anyways, other than that, I really hope that you enjoyed this video sort of setting up a baseline for this coming year testing of CPU coolers. I am Mike and I will see you in the next one. Have a good one, guys.